so much, Elena, for that generous, heartfelt introduction. I would like to point out, first of all, that I was promised 80 people in the room, no more. <laughs> I'm not very good with numbers. <laughs> and I'm nervous. And I'm nervous because this project, Breath, is the first moment in my life as someone who writes and who's someone who makes that I can come together and say that I've made writing, that I've made a book, I've written a book. It's a book which is sculpture. This is the first time in these last days when I've been doing interviews with literary critics and art critics that I've been able to talk about myself as one person, not this dreadful bifurcation, this dreadful division into who are you? Do you write? Do you make? Actually, I'm one person. So where do you begin? I want to begin by saying that I'm not going to go on for too long. There are many people here who wants to sit down. But I begin with a hesitation. I begin with a breath. Where do I start? Do I begin with a hesitation over the color white with porcelain? Do I begin with a hesitation, a pause, a breath over the white page, over paper? Or do I begin with a hesitation over poetry, that moment within the poem when the line changes and you take a breath, the caesura, that incoming breath. Where do I start? Which breath do I take first? Which of these three white topos do I start with? I'm going to start with clay. I'm going to start with the fact that as a five-year-old boy, I persuaded my father, who was a clergyman in the Church of England, to take me to an evening class for families. And I went down when I was five years old to an art college, and we went down these steep stairs into a cellar. For some reason, they always put potters in cellars. It's a mysterious, dreadful thing. They think that all potters need to be damp. They need to be underground. It's a great terrible mystery, clay potters underground. We went down these stairs, and I was in my first ever pottery studio. I was five years old. There was a huge wheel. I was helped onto the potter's wheel. I was given a lump of brown clay, uh, and I made my first pot on the wheel. It was extraordinary, this experience, this extraordinary experience, this alchemical, alchemical experience of taking one material and it changing into another. One material changed into another. And I knew at that moment that there was something strange about this process, this particular process, this time, this material, my hands. I couldn't do it. It was difficult. I came back the next week. There was my dreadful brown pot waiting to be glazed, to be fired. And this is the 1960s. There were all these different buckets of different colors, violet, lime green, orange, tangerine orange, and black. And I chose to make my pot white. I'm now almost 55. That's an awful lot of white pots. <laughs> but what is it about that white pot that has kept me going? and kept me returning to the experience of what it is to sit with your hands in silence at a wheel with white material and make a vessel. It's something about the fact that inside every vessel, 
is an internal volume. And what is that internal volume? It's nothing more than a breath. One vessel after another after another is a way of counting your breath. When I sit early in the morning, before everyone and the world gets hold of me and shakes me with all the things I haven't done, I sit and count my breath, one pot and then another and then another. And that breathing in and that breathing out is a discipline of thinking about what it is to make an object in this world. And why white? Why porcelain? Porcelain for a very serious reason. Porcelain because it is the material, the material. I mean this. The material which transforms the world. It begins in China a thousand years ago. It begins on a hillside near Jingdezhen, the middle of nowhere, where they dig up white clay, they blend it, they transform it, and this extraordinary material is born, this material which is clay, earth, the things we tra tread on and trample on. But when it is fired in a kiln to the right temperature, it becomes utterly other. It's translucent. Light comes through it. It is that moment of poesis, of changing one thing into another, which happens in porcelain. And porcelain changes the world because along that silk route, all that wonderful, extraordinary caravanserai across that millennia, these white pots begin to emerge in Europe. Made by emperors, they trickle all the way across Europe. And when you go, as I do, and beg the cardinal archbishop in Venice to open the treasury in Marco of, Mar of the treasury of San Marco, and I go into the basilica there in the basilica in San Marco, right at the back amongst all the Byzantine treasures, is one small white pot that Marco Polo brings back from his travels, the first porcelain pot that has ever emerged in Europe. How cool is that? I have to say, it took me an age to get this lovely archbishop to agree. Difficult man. <laughs> Actually, this is being recorded, is it? Scrub that bit. <laughs> Sorry, entre nous, difficult man. Porcelain. Porcelain emerges in all parts of Europe, and, and no one can know how, it ma how it's made. It's a great mystery thing. People say that you, you, it's dug up, it's, the, it's, it's elements of bones, that it's an archaeological thing. This mystery, it's an arcanum. It's, it's the great mystery. How does porcelain get... So I decide that I have to go to China. This is my midlife crisis. I have to spend five years and understand why I've been using porcelain for 50 years. So I begin a whole journey of going to China, traveling up into the hills where this porcelain clay comes from. And I remember it distinctly. It was an August day, humid, terrible, humid day in the hills of Jingdezhen. And I'm with my driver and my guide, and we have big sticks because of all the snakes there. And we're going up to try and find a kiln where they fired porcelain a thousand years ago. And I look down onto the ground and I find a broken piece of porcelain from the Sung dynasty. And I pick it up and I'm in tears. This is my epiphany. This is what I came for all that way to pick up a piece of broken porcelain. And I look round and they're laughing at me because the whole bloody hillside is a whole great sheet of broken porcelain all the way up, tens of thousands of broken shards. The whole geography, the whole landscape is full of broken pots because porcelain is the great thing driven by power. It's driven by emperors. It's driven by this need to make many, many objects, to make them whiter, to make them purer. And this is when I realized that the story of white, the story of my clay, isn't a domestic drama. It's a drama about power. 
and that the quest for purity, for making the whitest pots in the world, which drives those dreadful Chinese emperors to make these beautiful things, is the same dreadful impulse to purity which drives Augustus the Strong in Dresden to try and reinvent porcelain in the 18th century that drives all the kings and princes of Europe to try and make porcelain here. It's a drive to make the purest thing in the world. And in that drive to make pure white object, people are destroyed. It's a very, very tough journey. And it's a journey that, for me, ended up with great difficulty at the gates of Dachau, where I discover that the quest for purity, the quest for white, the quest for this beautiful, ineffable, alchemical material, had led the SS to create their own porcelain factory within Dachau, within Dachau, to make the whitest, purest, most Aryan of materials, so that in Dachau you find the remnants of porcelain. How terrible is that? Purity is dangerous. But it's my clay. I want to recoup my clay. I want to bring it back to what it means to me. My second hesitation, the white page, that moment that we know as we sit and try and write when the white page is in front of us and everything is possible, that moment before the pen touches the page, that moment of power and powerlessness. My second hesitation is over paper, which begins in China and comes all the way and ends up here in Europe, reinvented, rethought. And then my third hesitation, the hesitation that's been part of my life since childhood over poetry. Poetry since childhood remembering, rethinking, writing, rewriting poems. <clears throat> Trying to understand how a poem sits on the page, what the relationship between the words, the weight of the words, and the weight of the page means. A conversation that I've had with my installations now for 20 years, because what I do when I bring my passionate belief that a vessel matters, a one porcelain vessel matters, and another does, and I bring them into conjunction with a space, a vitrine, a place of holding something safe, which is what you'll see in this exhibition breath here, what I'm trying to do is to make poetry. I'm trying to do what Zubaran does, in his still lives. We know the paintings of Zubaran, all those dreadful saints, all those martyrdoms, all those ecstasies. But in Zubaran's paintings, there's sometimes in one corner a beautiful white cup on a silver saucer, a moment of pause, a moment of still life, a moment where poetry happens in a different sphere. We know it from Zubaran, we know it from Morandi. We know these ways, Shada, of stilling the world, bringing a breath around an object and putting it down in the world. It's a kind of poetry. So when I'm asked to make a book for Ivory Press, I think I'm going to bring paper from China and Japan and Germany and England. I'm going to bring porcelain from China. I'm going to bring gold, because porcelain is white gold. 
I'm going to try and make a palimpsest, a rewriting of one text on top of another, one life of journeying on top of another, and I'm going to try and make poetry. And I say, I'm going to try and make a book for Paul Celan. Why Celan? Celan, the great poet, born in Romania, writes in German, his family is killed in the Shoah. He takes his life 50 years ago next year in Paris, having written the most powerful body of poetry in the 20th century, someone I've been living with all my life. I'm going to mook make a book for Paul Celan. And bless them, Ivory Press say, of course you're going to make a book for Paul Celan. And we go and meet the most wonderful letterpress printer in London. We talk to the most extraordinary binder in London who understands vellum and into the vellum bindings, which you'll see in three and a half minutes next door. In each of those vellum bindings is a piece of medieval manuscript that I found and is bound into the volume, a palimpsest. It's hidden back into the binding of the volume. And I work with the incredible team here, typographers and passionate believers in the book, to make a book which can be held within a box that can be opened as big as a medieval Bible, a Bible that you can stand around and read, not privately, but in, in public. And in that book are the poems of Paul Celan, and I write a new text, and this is my text. The poet Paul Celan gave a lecture in Darmstadt, 1960. He had won a prize. He rarely wrote prose, rarely gave lectures. There are only two interviews, and a response to a request for information is five lines long. His lecture is hard and hesitant. It keeps trying to start. His first sentence begins with a word and a pause. Art, you will remember, he says, is a... And then he writes, there are snags after nine lines. There are snags. He finds a terrifying falling silent. It takes away his and our breath and words. Poetry, writes Celan, can mean an atem vende, a breath turn. Who knows, he writes, perhaps poetry travels this route, the route of art, for the sake of just a breath turn. He writes of this moment between breathing out and breathing in. With the eye, the estranged eye set free here and in this manner, perhaps another is set free. Perhaps it is in this strange moment of pause that poetry is possible. But Celan cannot find words to fit together easily. German is his language. But German is also the language that took his family away. So he brings words together into newness Lichtzwang, light duress, atemvende, breath turn. He compacts words and he breaks them open. He spills them from one line to another. His poems get shorter. They become fragments, cries, exhalations, attempts to start, attempts to make sound. The spaces around the poems get larger. There is more white page than words in his last books of poetry. He writes, finally, does one take, when thinking of poems, does one take roots with poems? Are these roots detours from you to you? They are also, at the same time, roots on which language becomes voice. They are encounters. They are blueprints for being, ascending oneself ahead in search of oneself a kind of homecoming, 
Homecoming is powerful. Homecoming, he writes, is what his mother will never know. Homecoming, he says, is the whiteness of his mother's hair that will never return. And then, so movingly, Celan thanks us for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, I find something which consoles me a bit for having walked this road in your presence, this road of the impossible. And then he finishes, and Celan walks off down the impossible road of art and life, having changed the world. He makes me think of roots and detours and encounters, and how you set yourself out to find yourself, and how grateful you are for some company on the road. It is this consolation, someone walking part of the way by your side, that means almost everything. It is this consolation, someone walking part of the way by your side, that means almost everything. And that, surely, is why we make art, to have someone walking alongside us, along our own road. That's why we're here, and that, surely, is why we need to breathe. Thank you.